Xenobiology. How we are making aliens. Searching for extraterrestrial life in the universe is a pretty arduous task. First, you need to identify where life might have formed. Then you must scour this planet and add a bazillion more before you get lucky and stumble across something which looks like a microscopic organism. But what if this life form came with us on the ship? How do we know it got here organically? Where are the rest of the aliens? Meh, this sounds too much like hard work. Let's just make a bunch of aliens here on Earth instead. Via the exciting new field of xenobiology. Number 3. How it works. Xenobiology is an offshoot of synthetic biology, which is a cross-disciplinary field involving both biology and engineering. They should call it bioengineering or something. Oh wait, they already did that. Bioengineering involves playing around with the molecular biology of an organism, tweaking its genetics, or making some other kind of unnatural change to a biological entity. Xenobiology takes this one step further, since it involves the study and creation of a brand new organism, one which does not, nor may ever, occur naturally anywhere in the universe. A creature whose origins lay entirely within the minds of men, and women, and all the other genders which exist these days. Some of the systems xenobiologists use to create new genetic structures and chemistries are not based on the DNA-RNA-20 amino acid framework which underpins life on Earth. Xenobiology seeks to create a new code and or a framework for carrying genetic information. These are called XNAs, or xenonucleic acids. Rather than being comprised of deoxyribonucleic acid or ribonucleic acid, as in the case of DNA and RNA, we now have new systems to play with such as hexose nucleic acid, HNA, threose nucleic acid, TNA, and cyclohexanyl nucleic acid, or CENA. Wait a minute. Cena? John Cena? The wrestler? Holy crap. If John Cena is right and we can't see him, does that mean Cena is the secret to invisibility? Cracked it. I are so smart. Another form of xenobiology involves adding new letters to the existing genetic alphabet which forms our DNA's base pairs. The current alphabet contains four letters, G, T, C, and A. Xenobiology seeks to add new letters based on synthetic nucleotides, such as P and Z, whose creation was outlined in the Journal of the American Chemical Society back in 2015. And this is just the start. A 2008 study conducted by Aaron LeConte and others of the Scripps Research Institute suggests up to 60 new bases could be added to the genetic alphabet, with 3,600 base pairs enabled as a result. Not only does this hint at an exciting future for the field of genetics, it also means we might one day be able to spell out a bunch of swear words using nothing but DNA base pairs. And really, isn't that the goal? of all modern science. As well as the examples mentioned already, there are further xenobiological studies being conducted into the creation of new versions of the enzymes which form DNA and RNA in the first place, and the reassignment of genetic codons which are currently unused. But what is the point of all this? Why do we need to create brand new organisms and genetic instruction manuals when we've got exotic creatures like ponies tardigrades, and Dutch people already. Number two, why we're doing it. If you want to understand something, you must replicate the process which created it. This is great advice if you're looking to explore how life on Earth began, but less so if you're curious about how that rotting corpse found its way into your septic tank. By attempting to create life synthetically using xenobiology, Mankind could potentially unlock the secrets to the origin of life, not just here on Earth, but all life throughout the universe. 
Another amazing possibility is that xenobiology could help us to work out what kind of life might exist elsewhere in the cosmos, without us having to actually go there, scoop up some of them and bring them home to study. For example, there may be complex life forms present within the lakes and streams of hydrocarbon chemicals on Titan, the largest moon of Saturn. These life forms would differ from anything on Earth, since their genetic makeup would be tailored to fit Titan's specific environment. The old school way of analyzing this life involves a multi billion dollar space submarine or a three billion kilometer round trip with no guarantee of success. But through the use of xenobiology, we can replicate these potential life forms on Earth by making an educated guess as to the conditions needed for life to arise on Titan. Xenobiology could also lead to genetic modification and biotechnology becoming safer and more widely accepted by the public through the creation of something called a genetic firewall. This term is used to describe how xenobiologists might make new organisms incompatible with traditional life by designing them in such a way that prevents horizontal gene transfer. Horizontal gene transfer describes the movement of genetic material between organisms by any method other than the hereditary system between a parent and their offspring, which is known as vertical gene transfer. Eat a genetically modified goose and it messes your DNA up, that's horizontal. Number 1. What are we doing? It's all well and good looking to the future of xenobiology and predicting what we might discover, how we might use it, and what color unicorn you're going to order when science allows for their glorious return to Earth. But what are we using this technology for now? Let's find out. In the United States, Floyd Romersberg of the Scripps Institute recently led a team which modified the genetic code of E. coli bacteria to include two new synthetic DNA bases, X and Y. Romsberg says that this development should eventually allow us to program the bacteria to do as we please, which in turn could lead to its use in treating a range of serious diseases. Another xenobiological experiment this time led by a team of international researchers based at Imperial College London, has replaced one-third of the genetic material in baker's yeast using five synthetic chromosomes derived from DNA. Much like the previous example, this project's findings could assist with the treatment of disease, with a successful replacement of yeast DNA hopefully meaning that faulty human DNA is replaceable allowing genetic conditions like cystic fibrosis and Down syndrome to become a thing of the past. J. Craig Venter is also doing incredible work in the field of xenobiology, as in 2010 he claimed that his company was the first to create a fully artificial life form when his team synthesized an entire bacterium genome and inserted it into another cell. Strictly speaking, this organism wasn't entirely artificial. It was a synthetic replication of an existing life form. The next big step will be the creation of something which has never existed before. A 100% unnatural organism born of a laboratory. It seems we're not far from such a momentous event, but how close are we to creating such a being? And where else might xenobiology take us? We're going to explore this idea further in our bonus video the Possibilities of Xenobiology, which you can watch on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash strange mysteries. For a $2 a month pledge, which you can cancel at any time, you'll get to watch this, and all of our bonus content, which goes deeper and darker into every topic than YouTube allows. If you don't want to donate, then bull****. We know you wanted more. Strange mysteries on YouTube and our Patreon bonus videos weren't enough to quench your search for truth, to give you that sense of awe and wonder again, to go past what you thought was the end, to give you the answers you seek but which only lead to more questions. That's why we just up the stakes. Chemicals of reality. Reality, consciousness, brains. What else is there? Ask yourself that question. Perhaps that's all there really is. But perhaps everything else is found within a place where these ideas, these things, overlap. Some 
thing, some place that is undefinable. To many people, altering certain chemicals in their brains produces what they would simply call hallucinations. In fact, what we're going to discuss specifically used to be called the businessman's trip, as one could enjoy it. Come down and put your pants back on in the time it takes to eat lunch. It wasn't taken seriously. Well, unless, of course, you started digging. And some people, including us, did. Already, though, to many people, this chemical is special amongst others. Very special. To them, it represents something more meaningful and incredible, as if it's the gateway to the next level of consciousness. The ticket to a higher reality barely explored by most humans. It is the entry point to a new reality visited by only a select few whose minds have become enlightened through the use of this exotic substance. For this reason, it's commonly referred to as the spirit molecule. But is its reputation as a mystical mind opener deserved? Or is it and everything it represents just a load of bullshit? We look at, investigate, and dive deeply into nearly all available research regarding this question from nearly every angle feasible. And in the course of doing so, stumble upon unexplainable patterns, correlations, and neurological evidence for a reality existing beyond this one. Watch this hour-long Strange Mysteries premium video, Chemicals of Reality, as well as many more to come by becoming an elite premium member of our Patreon at patreon.com slash strangemysteries.